Thank you so much for listening to my interviews. William Wallace for America. With me today is State Representative Paul Hollis. Representative, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing good. Doing good. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And thank you for showing me this really unique view of the rotunda. I mean, it's it's phenomenal it's up here. It's an underappreciated viewpoint in the state capitol. Not many people know about, but I love coming up here, and it's quiet. So. We, we got the American flag, and people can see that. Maybe we'll step to the side at the end of the video and let, let people see that, that American flag and all the other flags you know, that are up here. Well, where exactly is your district? I've got a, a portion of uh, St. Tammany Parish. Um, the heart of my district is actually in uh, Lacombe, but I have Pearl River, uh, Slidell, Mandeville, Covington, and Abita Springs. Well, your district goes all the way to Pearl River, Louisiana? Just a whisper of it. I don't have Pearl River in its entirety, but a portion of Pearl River. Same thing with all the other different cities that I had mentioned. They're not the city in, in their entirety, but a portion thereof. It's an unusual district. Well, the Louisiana legislative session starts next week here, and we got a lot of bills being filed, a lot of, a lot of people coming together. I think Louisiana is really at a pivotal point right now where they're trying to bring not only more people together, but they're trying to bring the right packages together to get the right incentives for people to stay in Louisiana and for businesses to come to Louisiana. Exactly. Do, you, do, you, do, you feel that, do you feel that sense of urgency? I do. I think that uh, the special session that we had earlier this year to address a lot of the insurance challenges. I know a lot of folks are um, opening up their mail and they're looking at insurance rates that aren't going up 10, 20 percent. They're doubling, some folks tripling, you know. I think about the folks that are trying to buy a house right now and the interest rates have you know, more than doubled, almost tripled. And then you look at homeowners insurance. And so I'm glad that we did an incentive program to get insurance companies to come to Louisiana. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that we need to do all kinds of things in order to do what we can. I mean, the fact is, is tort reform is uh, essential. You got to add to that that we're storm prone. We're, you know, we're getting hit by natural disasters, and when you have, you know, a cocktail of those unfortunate things, um, insurance rates are going to go up. But I do think that my colleagues come here with the spirit of we've got to do something to, you know, do what we can to bring insurance rates down, and that's just one of the many different issues that we're going to be addressing in the coming months. Something that comes to my mind before before we start talking about your legislation for this year is, you know, Louisiana gets hammered with homeowners rates, high rates of insurance because of our hurricane disasters. But you know, does the same thing happen to people in the Midwest? I mean, they're at, they're experiencing a higher than usual, maybe not higher than usual, maybe it's just an average, I don't know. But you always hear about it more than usual because of the media, right. tornadoes. Yeah. You know, do, do they experience the same kind of homeowners rates, you think, because of there's, that, with tornadoes? It's, it's a good question, and there's no state that's immune from, you know, significant natural disasters. Um, I mean, you talk about um, hurricanes in Louisiana, you talk about tornadoes, you can talk about flooding if you live out west, you know, you can talk about um, earthquakes. So, you know, there's very few states that have the luxury of not having major, you know, natural disasters that pop up from time to time, but getting hit with significant significant storms here many a times over the last five, ten years, you have to expect that insurance rates are going to, um, you know, be adjusted, and, and they are, and it's unfortunate because people, you know, they're not, you know, the hair on the back of their neck's not standing up, they're, they're freaking out, and, right. and I am as well, because you look at insurance rates to where they used to be five years ago compared to today, and they've gone up astronomically. You know, there's only so much, though, that we can do with policy initiatives to hopefully, you know, bring that curve uh, price increase down but whatever we can do uh, we're looking forward to doing what we can because that's one of the main issues right. I can tell you Bill that 10 years ago nobody would ever say that was one of the main issues but there's again a lot of issues that we need to discuss and this is a shorter session you know in odd numbered years like we're in now uh, it's an abbreviated session we have a limit of five bills um, per uh, legislator and uh, you know we hope to get our work done within um, 45 working days over a period of uh, 60 days. That'd be interesting. So let's talk about your legislation. You, you have uh, five non-fiscal bills. How many do you have? I have four. Four? Let's talk about those. I became let's... the most popular guy in this building having that fifth and final one, but I was going to file a bill on an unusual issue, but at the last moment I said, no, I'm not going to do that. But the other four bills, one's insurance related, um, one is um, HOA related. I think there's a lot of really good HOAs out there, but there are also some really really terrible ones where um, you know you walk into a lot of courtrooms and lots a lot of times outside it says uh, the foundation of liberty is the 
impartial administration of justice, which is kind of a, a peculiar thing, but there's nothing, you know, it's an extremely logical statement. Um, I find that a lot of HOAs pick and choose um, people as to who they want to follow the rules and who they're going to uh, go after, and that's unfortunate. But I mean, across the United States, the number of HOAs uh, continues to grow. So on the on the overall, I think they must be doing something right. But there are some bad actors that are out there, and I do think that HOAs and large communities, I think they ought to have to have um, annual reviews, a CPA review their records, and so that's one of my bills that's smart, right. dealing with HOAs, and it's just common sense. Um, another bill is uh, something that folks in St. Tammany brought to me. They were outraged because in public libraries there were images and uh, some of the books that were um, inappropriate. And I said, did you bring me one of these books? Because I wasn't even familiar with the issue. This is just a couple of months ago, and they gave one to me, and I thought it was going to be, you know, one of those literature books from the, you know, late 1800s that, you know, we might have read while we were in high school. Right. But this was like a picture book, and it was highly offensive. And so I said to them, I will make a commitment to carry a bill. Um, that gives local library um, boards uh, more oversight through the local governing um, authority. And St. Tammany Parish, we allocate $12 million annually to our uh, libraries. That's uh, a millage that they get mm -hmm. uh, each year. And uh, the idea that you'd have um, folks that serve uh, not at the pleasure of the local governing authority with a five-year um, term, I, I just like more accountability than yes, that. So I get it. what I've done is um, crafted a bill that just says that they serve at the pleasure of the local governing authority. If you live in an area with a police jury uh, or a parish council or whatever the situation may be, it just empowers them because they're elected. And so if they see things that aren't in keeping with the will of the most people in their area, they'll probably take some sort of action. And what I find interesting about that is, and not to use the word confusion in any, any non or assuming way, I'll say, but I think what's happening is a lot of groups are coming out against this type of legislation because they want to say that it's anti-LGBTQ or anti, but that, from what I understand, just correct me if I'm wrong, and what I understand is that's not the case at all. These bills are not designed to be against anybody for the, how they choose or how they live their lives. It's it's being done to protect just children as you know minors, much the same way you know a minor cannot go into a strip club mm -hmm. right now under a certain age. Uh, a minor cannot buy alcohol. They cannot buy cigarettes. And what basically this, the, the, what I think is the, the intention of this type of legislation is that a minor cannot buy porn or view porn like they would be able to buy it because they, they can't buy it in a store either. Right. You're just saying they should not be able to have access to it. You're not trying to ban books from, you know, ban books or ban LGBTQ thinking. You're just trying to say, hey, we got to put a barrier up between children and this type of material. Is that, am I correct on that? Yeah, in fact, you understand it quite well. Um, Hollywood, as it pertains to the movie industry, um, did this a long time ago. You know, they've got an R, they've got a PG-13. Um, no G, different than Hollywood. You know, and so all, all we're doing is saying, hey, you know, there are certain books that need to be flagged to be held aside um, to where, you know, you don't want a young person being able to access it. and. Honestly, I've not seen that many books. I don't imagine it's you know dozens of books. I just think that there's a small quantity of books that are out there uh, that are uncomfortable for a parent to look at and say, my 10-year-old child could walk into this library and not only look at it but check that book out. I, I just don't I don't think that's in keeping with the folks in our area. But again, if your area has a different perspective on it, um, all I'm doing is empowering the local governing authority to have more leverage to use um, with those that are charged with deciding what books and how they're uh, distributed in their um, public libraries. So you're so, not trying to take them out of the library, you're just trying no. to put a barrier up between those books and children. That's exactly right. That sounds pretty simple to me and that sounds very, even it's still very pro First Amendment. Yeah. It's just it's just putting the same barriers up that we have in society already. I think it's a very logical bill. I hope to get the support of the legislature and I look forward to it being signed into to law. So before we go to number four, I'm going to go backwards to the HOA. What is the primary intention of this bill? Because we always hear about the HOAs and what always is, is, is you know, interesting to me is that these HOAs are made up, the bylaws and the regulations are always made up by our own neighbors that we live next door to right. in areas that we chose to live in. You know, why in the world would all of a sudden they be, you know, they, is it just that they get that, that taste of power so they write in their bylaws, you know, I don't like my neighbor's mailbox, so I'm going to say no mailboxes of that color or that, you know, that, uh, you know, that type of mailbox should be allowed. Right. It's almost a form of discrimination if you think about it. 
Well, there are, and I won't get into it, three different types of personalities of those that serve on a HOA board. Um, and I served on a board once before, and I did it for a short period of time, and I didn't particularly uh, enjoy it. But it's something I'm not, you know, um, I'm not dismissing. It's, it's important work that people have to do. Um, what I do not like, though, are HOAs that um, judge people um, for, say, leaving their garbage cans out too long. Um, and then somebody else leaves them out even longer. The person that leaves them out for the longest period of time doesn't get a fine in the mail, um, but the person that leaves them out 20 minutes too late does. And so my point is, is unfortunately, I do think that some HOAs pick and choose the people that they want to poke at, and it's, it's, it's a terrible situation for someone to have to be in because I'm all about you know, rights for property owners. Most people like myself, you don't, you don't just buy a house and pay for it all at once. A lot of folks like myself pay for it over 30 years, you know, sometimes even longer. Right. But my point is, is, you know, for a lot of people, it's their single biggest investment. You live in it. And the last thing you would want to do is have an HOA board that you feel like is um, poking at you unnecessarily or um, unfairly or targeting you. But worse than that is when homeowners go to their annual board meetings or quarterly or however often they are, when you look at the expenditures and you think about you know, a lot of these take in quarterly um, assessments, fees, whatever you do, whatever you want to call them, they're extraordinary amounts of money. And the accounting in some of these cases looks like it's been you know, jotted down on the back of a cocktail napkin. Yeah, right. And so I just think to have them have to go through some sort of auditing process to account for those monies uh, that were taken in and spent um, should be available to the people. And that's all that my bill is uh, seeking to do. And I purposely draw a line at the size of the community. I mean, if it's a 10 home, 10 resident community, it would make sense. But in larger communities dealing with larger amounts of money, I do think that that ought to be a requirement that HOAs have to um, adhere to. And I think that HOAs will continue to grow because, again, I'm not implying that HOAs on the whole are bad. I, don't, I do not believe that. I just believe that there is a percentage, a small percentage, um, that operate in a way uh, that is extremely inappropriate. And like we do here at the state capitol, often we have to create policy that does um, try to weed out the bad actors. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what I'm trying to do. And what I like about this is, you know, well, I say like about it, what you're referring to them on accounting for the money, there's a, an association in St. Tammany right now that's going to spend a lot of money on, on a new building and they're kind of bypassing the will of some of the people. So it kind of covers both things like you're talking about, right. you know, finances and money. Before we go to number four, number one was about, about insurance. What was that one about? Oh, a little bit more insurance? detail what it does. Yeah, I'm actually still in the process. We drafted a bill, um, but it's in, it's still in the working phase. Okay. In fact, we had a deadline that was Friday. Wednesday it had to be in construction, so to speak. Friday it had to be filed. But I guess my point to you is I got a lot of people that have come to the table. In fact, sometimes I file a bill. The HOA bills want them. It's kind of a cattle call. And, and what I mean by that is, hey, bring me your ideas. Because it doesn't mean that you know this bill, this legislation, exactly as it yeah. is, is what I intend to have passed, a lot of times they need work. And the insurance bill, I believe, needs some work. And so when you file a bill, it goes public, everybody comes to the table. Sometimes while you're you know, running the bill and sometimes in advance, have you thought about this? Would you be open to this amendment? My point to you is that's kind of where we're at um, with the insurance bill. But I don't want to imply with the HOA bill what I've got. Do I think it's absolutely perfect? No, but it's a starting point. And I do hope that negotiations occur with all folks on any side of the issue that they think will bring it to an improvement because at the end of the day what do I need you know 50 percent plus one on the exactly. house side then I got to do the same on the house floor then I got to march it over the Senate committee and then the Senate floor and then I got to cross my fingers and uh, hope Hold the governor is willing to sign it <laughs> yeah. you know but if he doesn't sign it I don't think he'll veto it he'll just let it you know go into force and that's the process kind of like the old yeah. civics lessons when we were you know in what ninth tenth grade exactly. whatever it is when the coach taught the class the, yeah. I'm teasing I mean <laughs> sometimes it was the coach more often than not it was the coach yeah, well, but the important coach, lesson exactly. yeah. health class too yeah, always yeah, you know the ones that in his you think shorts and his, in his in his white tube socks that go up to his knees you know and yeah. you know interesting stuff but you know you you, you brought up something that i want to get like a point to educate the public on when you talked about filing your bill and you, and you say that's not completely done yet mm -hmm. i'd like to point out that that this is the process where a lot of people don't realize that here in the capitol building there's hundreds of employees that take all of this legislation 
and they make sure that it doesn't conflict with other bills in the past. They make sure that it kind of, you know, will work well with, with our Constitution. Yep. They, they kind of go through the legalities of it. And then when it goes to the committee, that these bills are still open for people to come in and testify for it or right. against it, or add it, or other legislators, as you pointed out, to add amendments to it. Exactly. So, you know, this is all part of the, of the, of the you know, baking process, if you will. Yeah. So you have a fourth one that we haven't covered yet. What's the fourth one? Well, the bill that I think um, right now is uh, one of the, the du jour, so to speak, of the day um, <laughs> is something that I visited back in 2015, so wow, eight years ago. Um, we had an unfortunate situation, you might remember, in St. Tammany Parish where we had an elected official um, commit a criminal act, ended up going to jail. Um, during that time period, there were a massive group of people um, in my area that uh, did a recall effort against this individual. It wasn't 10 or 15 people. This was dozens of people showing up on the weekends, canvassing the neighborhoods, trying to get the signatures. And they came to me after the 180 days and they said, it's impossible. It's absolutely impossible. And I agreed with them. We allow for recalls in Louisiana. If somebody does something really beyond the pale, and what I call a recall is just looking for real-time accountability, we allow for that. Now, I say that, Bill, to say there are 30 states that don't. You get a term of, I get a four-year term, but there are two-year terms, there are six-year terms. Some would argue, well, that's the term, and, and you know, you mm -hmm. serve, and, and when that's over, then, you know, you, you, you move on. Right. But I don't believe in that. I'm glad that we're a state that allows for a recall because I do think that there are rare uh, circumstances where if some you know group of folks wants to get together and toss somebody from office because they've done yeah. something egregious or a number of different things that are egregious, then they, they should be able to have that ability. In Jefferson Parish, there this was years ago, um, there was an attempt to, at the time, uh, they had a, a fellow that was doing things that a lot of folks felt incredibly inappropriate. And so there was an individual who had up that recall effort uh, named Robbie Evans. I had called him. We got off to a bad start because I said, hey, after 180 days, when you fail at getting signatures, you know, can you come to the Capitol and testify? And he's like, we're going to get the signatures. And <laughs> they, they didn't. He didn't know <laughs> yeah. what I knew, which is in 100 years of Louisiana recall history in a large area, no recall had ever uh, been successful because getting the signatures are so challenging. And so my point with this is, in 15 and then 17 and 18, it took three years to get it passed. In 15, we did a study. In 17, I presented a bill. In 18, we finally got it passed. But I was um, joined by the organizers from St. Tammany, the organizer from Jefferson Parish, and they told the committee how hard it was. And fortunately, we got it passed. And we've made it so that the percentage of names needed to sign the petition, instead of being 33%, uh, we lowered it to 20%. Oh, nice. And so it was significantly lower. But watching you know what's going on or what happened in New Orleans I am still of the belief that we need to you know still do some tweaks to our recall legislation and uh, that's what I anticipate doing and and one of my colleagues on the Senate side is bringing a bill um, that would make the signers of the petition private a lot of people you know have a healthy dose of paranoia and I understand mm -hmm. that and signing a public document to recall an elected official can be you know kind of scary to some folks and um, you know there's going to be an argument do we keep these signatures um, private and you know I haven't really given a great deal of thought to that but I think there's pros and cons generally speaking I like you know the sunshine cleanses things bring it right. all out in the open but I say that to also say that I understand that some people putting their signature on a fairly formal document to recall an individual it can come with the you know a degree of concerns the one in New Orleans they were worried about the retaliation they, they had you know fears of retaliation by the by the mayor yeah. you know if they if they signed it or not but i i love the idea of lowering that threshold um because we saw also in new orleans that there, you know when they went to the the signatures which i'm still you know have second thoughts about because when you hear about how they went to the signatures and not all of them are verified verify by the right. Secretary of state you know i know how hard those people worked right. to get the right signatures but when you've lowered that threshold you know, now if somebody comes in and recorrects, it's got to get pretty low in order to be able to have enough disparity to throw it out. Right. But, but what, what's wrong with having a second election? We have multiple elections all the time. What's wrong with lowering that to that 20 percent? Because if you've got somebody that's doing bad or not, not doing their job, right. lowering that threshold and just kicking them to another election process where the votes are secret. Right. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. If, if they're if they're good, people like them. They're going to keep them in. If they're bad, they're going to kick them out.
Well, in Love Orleans, it. a lot of people, you know, it didn't do the math, but under the old system of 33%, they didn't need it almost 80,000 signatures. We lowered it to 20, and that brought that number down to like 47, 48,000. Um, my bill, though, the main thing that it does is makes the number not based on the total number of people that are registered to vote in that district. Instead, it makes it on the total number of folks that actually voted in the previous election. Oh, nice. And just so you'll know, in the other 19 states that allow for recalls, the vast majority base it on those that actually voted. So we're not unique, but we're, you know, one of a handful of states that... And the way, another reason I like that is because oftentimes we find that a lot of the registrations that are on the books are either old, outdated, people move. It's a debatable you know, number. It's a debatable and number, then, but when, when you have who showed up at that last election... That's concrete. not a debatable. That's, that's, that's a signature verification. As it is now, Love it's when you show up to do the recall because you get 180 days. So is it at that point in time you do register voters? Is it when you bring the signatures in? Is it the registered number of voters at the time? But like you had said, there's people that move. There's people fortunately get incarcerated. There's unfortunately people that pass away. You just don't know, you know how to come up with a concrete number. The best concrete number is how many people participated in that election, and then you use that to apply your percentage, and then that's the number. I want for folks to go to the registrar and immediately be given, this is your exact number. And not conversations and negotiations have to occur as to, you know, because that opens it up for all kinds of um, litigation. And I think that's why most states do, you know, that concrete number of how many votes were cast in that election of that individual that's attempting to be um, recalled. I think recall should absolutely be hard, and I don't mean to imply yeah. anything otherwise. I think very serious issues, um, recalls are an effective tool to give people real-time accountability. And so I want to support it. I just at the same time think that there are a number different issues the way um, we handle them. I love this. This is one of my favorite ones. Yeah, thank you. You say du jour, I would say of the year. You know, yeah, maybe or, so. You know, It'll be a, a highly be... um, watched, covered um, kind of scenario because um, I think everybody knows that we could use some improvement in that area of law in Louisiana. Make, but there's make, so make, many Make elected issues. officials more accountable yes. for their actions. I love yes. this. Love this. One more question for you before we wrap up here. I think that I always tell people that I think freedom in America is under attack. Yes. And uh, it's, you know, most people think of the freedom as, you know, being First Amendment or Second Amendment, but a lot of people don't think about all the freedoms that we're losing through the alphabet agencies and the and the laws that we created in, in the in the bureaucratic bureaucratic levels yes. of of of, of um, you know of our government that is a, that gets circ or the Constitution gets circumvented. So, how do you think that freedom is under attack in America? How does it relate to Louisiana, or do you think that freedom in Louisiana is under attack? Well, I would just say on that subject at the 30,000 foot level, let me give you an example. My uh, son and his fourth grade class will be at the Capitol uh, this week, and I'm really excited about that. And I do tell people when they come to visit the Capitol that um, America, you've given incredible freedoms, and I would just suggest that anyone never take that freedom for granted. Um, I hope that when kids come to the Capitol, they look around our beautiful Capitol. It's the most beautiful in the nation, although I've not been to every one, but I've been to a bunch. Um, don't take it for granted. Participate in the process. I think people have a, um, you know, a, a duty to show up and vote, to learn about the candidates. Uh, I always encourage people to do what they can to be a part of um, the process, because I, I guess my point to you is, is, you know, you have to protect the freedoms that we have, and you do, you do that by um, getting involved and, and letting your opinion uh, resonate with others and participating in our uh, Democrat process. There are some people that want to complain about whatever the issue might be, and I ask, you know, are you a registered voter? They've never even voted yeah. before, and I would say to them, then you're a part of the problem. You know, if you want to do good things, um, you've got to participate and you've got to stay informed. And I'm glad people watch your show, participate, yes, you. and you're very proactive. And this guy, I'm telling <laughs> you, a day doesn't go by. It's like the sunshine. If the sun's not, if William's not here, then something, <laughs> something's off. So something's I appreciate off. the work. Uh, thank that you, you very do, much. I advocacy. appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that. Like you said, it, it, it's about getting involved. And I just tell people who say, "Why well, don't register? I don't, I don't. I didn't register to vote, or I don't vote because my vote doesn't matter." You know, whoever's gonna get elected gets elected anyway. And I always tell people, it's not. Sometimes, even if you think that way, the the chance that you vote or the fact that you vote, right? The people who are counting the votes see what people are thinking. Whether yep. you think it matters or not, they know how you're thinking. Agreed. Once again, thank you very much. I My appreciate pleasure. it. Thank we'll, you we'll as step, well. We'll step one step back and hope yeah, you can see sure. that, that little view of the Capitol. Everybody else, please share the video, share the interview, and uh, we'll see you soon here at the Capitol.